Hello, welcome back to Psychology. I'm Miss Lee, and we are still in Unit 1, Scientific Inquiry. But today we're going to move on to psychological research methods, so how we do what we do. Section 4 is all about conducting research. If you haven't done so already, go ahead and grab your notes. we're going to be discussing today is the scientific method. We've talked a little bit about it before, how it came to be, but we're going to actually describe it and take a look at it. And we're going to look at a variety of qualitative research methods, including surveys. We're also going to talk about focus groups, interviews, narratives, and questionnaires. We're going to look at how procedures can be used to improve the validity or what we're actually studying in research findings. And we're also going to talk about this idea of descriptive statistics and qualitative data and how psychological scientists use both. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is the steps of scientific research. The first thing that we have to do when we are doing scientific research of any kind, including psychology, is first off, you have to start with a question. You have to have something that you want to figure out. You have to define a problem. So it could be as simple as posing a question based on experience that you have or something that you know a little bit about, but you don't feel like there are enough answers. Often in psychological research, we're talking about those constructs that we defined a couple of videos back. So these are things that can't be measured directly, like anxiety. So we have to make sure that we have research questions directed towards behavior, things that we can measure. We then form a hypothesis. Those if-then statements are going to come in real handy. So again, this was our example from a couple of videos ago. If I brush my teeth, then I can prevent cavities. So it's an educated guess, and it's worded in a statement. Our third step in scientific research is to test the hypothesis, to actually do the study, to ask the questions, to run the experiment. So we're looking at the evidence. The fourth step is to look for patterns, to, to really dig into the data that we collected in step three. So you're going to analyze what you actually got, and you ask yourself what all of that means. And then last, we draw a conclusion. We determine whether the findings that we collected, the data that we collected, if that supports our hypothesis, that if-then statement. And if they don't, then we may start back up at the beginning. So we, we may have to adjust our hypothesis. Now, one of the ways that we collect data is through surveys. In the survey method, people are asked to respond to a series of questions about a particular subject. So it could be in a direct verbal way, like an interview. It could be written or on the computer like a questionnaire. It could be in a group, like a focus group. There are some definite benefits to the survey method. You can, with a questionnaire, ask a lot of questions to a lot of people in a very quick amount of time for pretty inexpensive. And if you do it correctly, if you set it up like a Scantron, for example, you can get your answers very quick and analyze your data very, very quickly. But there are some problems. A lot of times when people are answering a survey or participating in an interview, they may not give the correct answers. Why? Before we answer that question, I want to tell you a little bit about the types of research you're going to hear me referring to over the next few videos. Qualitative, quantitative, and mixed methods research methodology. Uh, qualitative is basically where you are identifying data from abstract concepts. So you're asking questions that people are going to give their subjective feelings and beliefs about. Quantitative is collecting numerical data. So it's surveys, it's standardized tests, it's something that can be measured more directly. And mixed methods uses both methods. So when a researcher has a question, they usually have a question about a certain group of people or even animals. This is called the target population. So you have a question about a target population. This is the whole group 
that you have that question about that you want to study and get answers for. But it would be very, very difficult to get information from that whole target population. Let's say you have a question about what is America's favorite ice cream flavor. Well, it would be very difficult to find out that information because we can't possibly survey all Americans. So what researchers will do is they'll study a sample. They're going to get information from a small fraction of that target population. But the sample should be as similar as possible to the target population. So if you're trying to get information about the state of Tennessee, you wouldn't want to just ask questions in Memphis or Nashville. You would want to get representatives from all areas in Tennessee. Researchers love to use random samples, and this is really a very good way of doing research. Individuals in a random sample are selected by chance. It's basically like someone reaching into a hat and pulling out a name. Each person has an equal chance of being part of that study. And so the goal of a random sample is to represent the whole population if the sample is large enough and if it is done correctly. Another good way of coming up with samples is to use subgroups. So you want to make sure that your population is represented proportionately. If we are trying to represent the United States, we're going to want to make sure that our population is represented proportionately in the sample. So we're going to look at those subgroups like gender, like ethnic groups, and we're going to want to make sure that the groups that we are looking at represent the whole target population. In psychology, when we want to confirm the findings of a study, we do this thing called replicate. We repeat the study. We use the same exact steps, and it has to produce the same results as before. If it doesn't produce the same results, then there might have been a problem with the way it was set up to begin with. So replication is a very important part of conducting a research study. We want to be careful when we're generalizing results of a study. If we have not set up the methodology so that the target population is represented correctly, then we can't really generalize the results. We can't really say that all people feel this way or all people feel that way. For example, if researchers found that men prefer a certain type of car, the researchers could not conclude that women prefer the same type if they were not part of the study. This was hugely problematic in early research because many of the participants were recruited from the universities and colleges. A lot of the researchers were also professors at universities and so students were very easily, widely available to them. However, if you think back historically, who comprised most of the university students? White males. So you have to always question how the methodology of the study was set up to be able to generalize results. So these are some fancy words, validity and bias. These are some things that researchers look very closely at when they are setting up their research study. Researchers try and eliminate any threat to their study that will basically make their results invalid. They want to answer the actual questions that they have posed, and so they need to look very closely at any bias that could be involved in their findings. A bias is just a predisposition to a certain point of view. And even when you have volunteers for a study, you could have what's called a volunteer bias. Basically, that means that people who volunteer to participate in research often have a predisposed idea about research. They often have beliefs about research. Maybe they're very fond of doing research, and so they may be more willing to disclose personal information because of their increased interest in research. So all of that to say that you have to be very careful about how you set up your research. And that concludes section four. In this video, you learned about the scientific method, you learned about qualitative research methods, including surveys, and how researchers improve the validity of research findings. In our next video, we will be talking about the methods of observation and analysis of data. Can't wait to see you then. Bye for now.